Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the latest edition of the Dot Pro Wednesday podcast. Uh, with us, our special guest this week is Moo of Digital Chaos, who just qualified for the Manila major. Moo, congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How did that... Uh, so, you know, when you guys won, when you beat Shazam, how, what did you do to celebrate? I mean, was it was it one of those things where, you know, people were just going crazy? Or was it more one of those, hey, we, we expect to be here, or some of us have been there? I mean, you were at the last major, and two of your players won the last major. Like, how was, what was that like after you won? Uh, I wasn't as hype as Archon winning major qualifier, but <laughs> it was pretty hype. Then we went out and bought a $50 stick. So that was a good time. Nice. You guys were all in uh, Arizona, I presume, at the house playing and then just go off for steak afterwards? Yeah, we had a nice big team hug afterwards, you know, nice and sweaty. That's how <laughs> we like it. That's that's a nice reward for you guys. Um, well, in terms of, you know, in terms of the team house and all that situation, I mean, you guys hadn't had been there for like a month or so, right? So, so I mean, what's it like out there in Arizona and Describe that for us. Uh, it's nice for now. It's getting hotter. That's about it. I don't really leave the house much, you know. We just play Dota. And you have, a, I mean, you have a really interesting team because you have, um, I mean, everyone is pretty young. I guess Misery's like the old man on the team, but everyone else is between like what nineteen and twenty-one, and. Um, Misery is the old veteran, I guess, but you have people, you have like maybe the most, most diverse team ever. You've got a Ukrainian, a Macedonian, you've got Weha, who's, who's Syrian, um, you've got a Dane, and you've got an American. So what's that like in terms of, you know, like communicating and all that stuff? It's no different than anyone else, I think. It's not like we have language barriers or anything. Sometimes Roman or Resolution says, says funny things. That's because English is like his third language or something. When he's like playing pubs, do you ever hear him just like curse in Russian or like yell at the monitor in that way, or does he like blurt it out? Nah, he just he just talks differently. Okay. It's like it's like you know how Americans talk. We have our own little slang and stuff. Resolution's very uh, it's very appropriate always, you know. Oh, it's like it's very calm in the games. It's like guys, guys help. <laughs> help, <laughs> help me <laughs> the, the first thing people usually learn in a language is more or less how to curse I mean is everybody up to date with that can they all just you know trade blows with, with the best of them in pubs or what nah I mean I think everyone but Roman can again he just, we saw, he, just, uh, uh, he just drops the F-bomb a lot you know when he gets mad that's about it <laughs> We saw a tweet earlier with you guys. Uh, I think it was playing Rock Band, and uh, you know it, it looked like it looked like a lot of fun. And who keeps the team loose and like lightens things up? Like, is is that why you have Slacks as a sub? You were thinking uh, about putting them in. It's Sunsman. <laughs> Sunsman's the team meme. Whenever we feel down, we just make fun of them. You know, it's like <laughs> Sunsman. <laughs> we all just giggle. I like that. Who's the best? Who's the best Rock Band player? Oh, it's definitely me. Oh, Can yeah? Guitar or what? Yeah, I play on Expert, you know. I'm a real professional. Great. Gotta have you. I played a long time ago, like when it first came out. Mm. Like the 2000s, you know. <laughs> real long Five time ago. Three? Yeah, that's, that's the stuff. That's that's the one. That's the game right there, I think. Mm-hmm. These, are, these are all noobs, you know. You got like a cemetery of like the old instruments in your basement with like broken drums and stuff, or what? Nah, there weren't drums back then. It's just just guitars. Yeah, you didn't pick up the rock band. Oh fuck, rock band! Wait, what? Rock band's lame. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it was just the guitars back in the day before they added all the other stuff. Um, so, well, just trying to get a sense of who else is over there. I mean, you you have obviously Suns fan. Um, was, was was Ush with you guys? Is he like a coach kind of to you guys, or, or what? Uh, no, not Ush. I don't think we've ever actually talked to Ush. It's just kind of there, you know. We needed a sub, so mm. we 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 put him in. But pretty sure none of us actually have him added on Steam or anything. So 
you know. <laughs> well, you contact him on Twitter if you need a sub. Just got to hunt it's out somehow. Something like that. I'm sure we'll, we'll fly him in or something, you know, the day before. All right, you're in, buddy. <laughs> um, well, obviously, congratulations on, on qualifying. This is your second straight major. You were there uh, with Archon in Shanghai. And, uh, you know, it's coming into the qualifiers – um, what what teams were you expecting to meet like in the playoffs? I mean, I, I think pretty much you were one of the big favorites, and everyone expected you to advance. Like, what were your thoughts going into the qualifiers? I mean, it was just Shazam. That was the only competition, really. Never felt like we could really lose a game except versus Shazam. And even then, we felt pretty confident. And then, obviously, uh, the winners bracket finals didn't doesn't really matter. You don't get like a bonus for winning that. You just skip one series. Hmm. So we were just we we're seeing how it would go, like drafting against them and how those games it was like a test series, you know. Sounds like a scrim, because there's no way we lose to Drag Neal in their their form. So they're the ones who GG out in like ten minutes when we played them. Right. The, uh, that infamous uh five man gank top and then it an an instant GG out, right? Yeah, I mean it's pretty upsetting that they didn't that they didn't play the uh the finals but it was whatever and then pretty much figured out shazam after the winners practice knew what they're what they wanted and stuff because they they put everything on the table right there whereas you guys kind of held your cards closer to your chest like like you said you were experimenting or what i mean we didn't really have secrets but we had a few things we didn't we had, we had so many things to do okay I think we had uh, a better pool than them, more strategies thought out. And then what what was there? What was the key to them, you think? I mean, we we talked a lot about how much they protected MSS and uh, helped him out, or it was talked about a lot. Like, what, what do you think was the key to dealing with Shazam? Uh, they just did the same thing every game. So if you watch the finals, we kind of knew where they were without even having words. We're just like, they're going to be here, guys. We do this every game. <laughs> wow, that's... I mean, you know, it held true. Usually, usually pe- people may not describe, like professional players may not describe um, the, the strategic approach to a team in that much detail. And that's really interesting to hear that from you. I mean, is, is that something where it's like, some teams are much more predictable than others, and you know where they're going to be, and others aren't. Is is that like, you know, like you knew them that well, basically? I mean, Could every, that be every team has a has a style, right? Like, you know what they're going to want to do. You know what they want to achieve in the first twenty minutes. And Shazam was like the same thing every game, no matter what their draft was. Hmm. So we kind of predicted it. And uh, played around how they want to play, and that's why the finals felt very easy. It's not that they're bad; they're a pretty good team. It's kind of weird that they don't have a sponsor. It's just like we figured them out, and they didn't they didn't change their style at all to meet ours. Really, really interesting. You you did you had to play them six times, I think, right in one day in the final day, and yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, the, the drag Neal games, obviously, there was, like, the, the internet situation, and then you 15 minutes through game one, that series was finished, and you didn't have to play them. But potentially, you would have had to play, what, like, eight, nine games, um, or even more, depending on if the last series went longer. And, like, what, what was that like? Because for the previous qualifier, I you know, I think it was a lot looser. Obviously, two teams qualified, too. And you actually beat DC when you were on Archon. Uh, the previous one was was better just because it had because this 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 way it was designed was meant for two slots obviously with this winner's bracket and loser's bracket so when there's only one slot you have this winner's and loser's bracket actually means absolutely nothing coming from losers you know but in like the old qualifier it's like if you're winner's bracket then you have two chances to qualify because the finals mean a lot more and then if you win if you like won the first finals then you don't have to play the fourth day so it was a pretty big deal. But in this one, it's like you're going to play all four days, no matter what, if you're good. And like Losing a series doesn't matter at all. 
because you're going to end up in grand finals and there's like that's it <laughs> no no benefits for being winners you don't get choice you don't get an extra game it's just all it is right so you do you prefer kind of having that incentive to do better or have like a day off or are you is are you more like you know we can get into the flow and if we just keep playing dota like a ton of dota each day uh I mean, we played a ton to get ready for this, because we knew that we were going to play up to like nine games a day, so we were already ready for that. But it was kind of silly having a loser's, a loser's bracket, because it, it meant nothing. It was just like unnecessary games, and that's actually what it was for NA bracket, considering they didn't even play those games. And that the uh, there was actually an issue in group stage as well. At a enemy GG and Evernovas didn't play each other, so there was the schedule was like pushed ahead three hours. So Team Freedom had to play their match, and their players were like just preparing still. You know, they thought right. they had like three hours, and they just had to play immediately because these guys are like, no, we just we don't want to play our games. Like they don't mean anything. Which I mean, I don't blame them. You know, they have to play these games, and they're both like zero six. They can't mm. get into the next group stage. Next, like they can't get in the playoffs. But they still have to play according to the rules. Whether that means drafting and GGing out, you know, it's it's kind of shitty for the other teams. Yeah, uh, yeah. On the one hand, like I think so. Infamous's last game that uh, mattered when they knocked Enemy out. Um, they kind of just picked like a five man, went straight into Roche, and then just all went down one lane. They didn't actually bother with the lane phase, and that was like a twelve minute GG because once you know it didn't work, they were done, and they didn't really want to play anymore. So yeah, yeah. the last series just kind of didn't happen. And uh, I mean, yeah, that's kind of they just decided. It, yeah, it's like the example of a bad design in the tournament that happens. Games don't matter, but I guess that's just how it's always been with a bigger qual- big qualifier like this. It's like because there's this is like the only qualifier with an actual round robin group stage. Everything else is usually a bracket, just from start to finish. So it's uh, it's not always a bad thing, but it's it also wouldn't be the case if every team was kind of even, then every match would matter. But since the skill disparity was pretty high this this time round between like our us and our group and Shazam and their group, it was kind of silly. Because, like, Elite Wolves wasn't in the tournament. Stuff like that. There's a lot of teams that I didn't feel deserved to be invited. But they didn't have anyone else to invite. Uh, you mentioned there's a big disparity. Again, I think you and Shazam are the obvious favorites. Um, obviously, the patch had just dropped. So you, you've obviously probably been playing and practicing on it. But do you think that uh, the open qualifier teams, I think they did pretty well both of them made the final four like do you think that they gave them like a leg up to go through those open qualifier games and just get like more you know not just scrims under their belt i think they just they're just better teams they practiced harder i think a lot of the teams that got invited didn't actually expect to do very well and so they didn't they didn't train that hard and uh these open qualifier teams it's like you know you come up from the open qualifier and you win it and you're going to like the main stage and you're people that like have never been to lands. I mean, I've been here, right? Like, uh, like two years ago, you're like super hype. You just won open qualifiers with just this five pub stack you have, and then you're gonna be playing in front of these, you know, a million people watching you, even online. It's a pretty big deal. It's a lot of hype. It gets your name out there. So they play like much harder than these other teams. That's why uh, both open qualifiers teams went through. Just trained harder. Interesting. Uh, it, when you're when you're preparing or, or practicing for qualifiers, how much how much of your energy and effort goes into like looking at what the other teams are doing, or like you know, or did you just know very early on through scrims, hey, Shazam's the only threat. Let's focus on them. Or was it like, hey, do we have to kind of be aware of what other people are doing and maybe be ready for it? I mean, we played. I think everyone with the open call for entire teams at least once, scrim or another tournament. We had a general idea of what they wanted to do, and then like normal, you you uh, look at replays of every team before their match, for your match, just study them. Because every team, especially at this skill level, is pretty predictable. They kind of do the same thing every match because they're not comfortable with branching out to other strategies. So you watch one replays with all their drafts and stuff, and kind of understand 
you know what you want to do in the game, their game plan and your game plan. But we definitely studied uh, Shazam harder. Because they were the only other team we felt was a real threat, you know? Not to sound cocky, but it's the reality of things. I see. And and based on your experience in, in Shanghai and such, like the better teams usually have more in in the bag or because you know, there's been a lot of discussion about this, right? Some people said, for example, CDEC, TI5 had like the same consistent strategy and that was how they played. And it just, you know, it just fit well and people didn't beat them. Or do you think most teams at that level, at the major level, have like a lot of different ways they can go? Or are they pretty set as well? Uh, every team has like a general game plan, right? But uh, they have like different, like 10 different drafts so they can make this game plan happen and they know how to win. Whereas these these teams in the qualifiers that are like brand new, only been playing maybe like a few weeks, uh, they only have they kind of have this like we want this one draft and that's what we should be aiming for every game. So if they get uncomfortable, they don't play very well or like know what they're doing, you know. How did you feel about uh, your? Like basically six point eight seven, and the offlane. Um, you played some Sand King. Um, in the past, you've played a lot of heroes like Sardar, for example. You've even played some mid and uh, carry here and there. But uh, yeah, how did you feel about your hero pool um, and how that affected you? Six point eight seven. I felt like it was good. I liked this patch. Well, I still like it. it just came out with a lot of heroes that can be picked for every lane, every role. It's better than the last one. And the last one was also pretty good. So. I wasn't really worried. I mean, this patch is like it's pretty small, like in terms of the meta moving compared to other patches. They kind of just tweaked every number by like mm-hmm. one. They didn't. They didn't like the, like a patch before. They changed DP's abilities, Ricky's abilities. That didn't happen this patch. Just mm-hmm. a few new items, a few new number tweaks. And about those new items, do you think they're going to have a fundamental impact on the pro scene? Yeah, these these items will be bought at least yeah. like every game, raindrops and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's just like mangoes. You're gonna see them more as time goes on. People start figuring out what they actually do. I don't think anyone actually realized raindrops gave mana regen. Yeah, when it first came out, so no one bought it. They're like, ah, oh, this isn't worth it. Just it's like a hood, like a shitty hood that goes away. And right. they're like, oh, so it's, it's a it's a hood and a bassy ring. All right, I'm in. Um. I you feel validated like hearing you say that because I'm a huge fan of raindrops, and everyone's like, "You're crazy, man! What are you talking about?" So I, I hope I hope you're right on that count. <laughs> They're good. They're really good. Um, that recent uh, rebalancing patch that came out, the six point eight seven C, we're already at C. Um, they kind of like touched up everything. Do you think that, like for you specifically, did, did you think that impact any of your heroes in terms of like Beastmaster or Doom, like in any significant way? Uh. I think the Doom one was needed. There's no reason your E should level one should do half your health when you hit someone. But other than that, it's, the Beastmaster one was kind of weird. Mm-hmm. The boar slow not going through BKB, mm-hmm. but doesn't change much. I don't think it helps these heroes like Slaughter and Seven. But usually you just roar and they die, so it's like a hero's that hero doesn't really get nerfed. Uh, how, about, how about that alchemist change with the octarine? Because that hero was one of the most banned of of all in like in terms of the pick ban stages. Uh, I think uh, Galk's still good. Qualifiers. Maybe you don't see the Naga Siren cosplay every game, but <laughs> that build's still <laughs> still viable. You you played some uh, Sand King solo. This is a hero that I think is kind of like sneakily emerging a little bit. Like that caustic is just insanely good. It seems against. Melee laners, and you know, how do you feel about about that hero and his his role now? I mean, he's gotten a lot of buffs and changes recently. Uh, he's weird still. I wouldn't expect too much, but maybe he's picked every now and then. You know, it's kind of an awkward hero, kind of like Earth Shaker. You know, it's you got to get to your items and not yeah. lose. <laughs> In the meantime, it takes like a lot of investment, and he even kind of takes a lot of space too, right? Like. I've seen you play that hero in your stream, and it's you take up so much. Like you, you pick up farmer on the map that isn't usually accessible, but it's still a lot of you know creeps and jungle camps being taken up. Yeah, you're just walking around, 
trying to get FP off farm creeps when you can, because you need like three items before you feel useful. But luckily, you can farm it pretty quickly. People can't mess with you because you have the overpowered invisibility ability, you know? No one buys detection, so. How do you feel about some of the these other offline heroes that uh, have been tweaked a little bit? I mean, it's Clockwork, um, Centaur, and I mean, we haven't seen Stardar much, but like, how do you feel about those? Yeah, I'm sure Centaur is still dead. Heroes never coming back until they actually buff them. And uh, I don't know about Clockwork either. You're kind of shit on lane, and that, mean, that means a lot. So... It's kind of it's hard. Like you don't do damage. You're just kind of control, and there's better control. It's like puck and stuff. If you want that, so it's, it's not like a you know. You think of like clock like a bat rider, but bat riders like you last to someone and they're dead. Clock, you hook them and they're they might be dead. <laughs> maybe maybe you hooked the wrong target and you're dead. So. <laughs> That's true, and if you end up having to go with like a rocket build, if you can't really get into lane, then it really uh, won't, like hurts the damage. Yeah, you, you can't buy Iron Talon on Clockwork either. It's, it's too slow. You're not a That's like you're not a bat. You can't clear stacks. Mm. You can't gank people early on. Iron Talon is like the new diagnostic tool for offlane heroes. So it's like, can you buy Iron Talon or not? If not, it's, probably. It's probably kind of like, can you buy a Calling Blade too? You actually make use of it. Yeah. I, th I think one of the most talked about, most polarizing heroes of the patch change so far is, is probably got to be Marana. I mean, we saw that hero, like some teams seem to like her a lot, you know, especially in NA and some teams not so much. Like, what do you think, what do you make of Marana? Like, is this a hero that you would potentially play as an offliner instead of a, a mid or a core that we've seen mostly? Uh, I think she'll fall off and then come back. It's usually how it goes. She gets like super hyped, and then like this current tournament, she's not picked too much, and then she'll come back maybe later because people are figuring out like, hey, Rana's pretty squishy, guys. Kill her. You can uh, can out team fight her, you know, because she's just gonna run around the map and starfire your creeps. Yeah, but then, what does that really do, you know? At the end of the, end of the day, you're a Marana. I'm sure she'll see some play, not nearly as much as when she first came out, not first pick that. I see. I, you know, I, I kind of want to take you down memory lane a little bit. So, um, obviously, you were in Shanghai with uh, Archon, and, you know, there's some talk about it was hard for you guys to find a scrim at some point, and I think, you know, teams didn't really respect you. Uh, a lot, or nearly as much as other teams, and then uh, yeah, we we called it the walk of shame because we were on one end of the hallway, the very end. So our manager would walk down the other end of the hallway and knock on every door. No one would answer, or wow. they'd tell us they'd ask us who we were. And they'd be like, "No, we're busy." And then we're just like, "And why did you ask who we were?" <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh man, that, that went on for a couple of days. Yeah, Sebastian was telling us that that uh, Max really had it rough, like just trying his best to you know get your. Yeah, no one, no one knew who he was because all the managers know each other because they're there to like, every land, you know. So when he when he walked through the doors, no one knew his face, which is a big deal. And when they learned who he was, you know, oh, our con manager, oh, yeah, we don't want anything to do with you guys. Oh man, <laughs> so it was, was kind of rough. Did that leave a bad taste in your like like I just wanna I'm wondering what the discussion was because obviously um you know there's a lot of hubbub when uh, misery and weha joined you guys around that reshuffle time and, and I think you were I think it was pretty last minute for you too, wasn't it? Like leaving Archon and when Zetok was ineligible and all that. Yeah. I mean that was like the nail in the coffin, right? Three days before lock and I'm learning that one of my one of the players I wanted to play with can't play. Pretty shitty. So then I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm just going to take this other offer. Sounds good. Because he, he was on, um, well, Unknown, obviously, the first South American team to crack the majors, and he was their captain. And he was, you know, obviously infamous as four of those players. 
without him. And so how did you how did you get to know him? Or like do you guys does he speak English? Like like how did you guys communicate and stuff? He speaks like he speaks like Cade Man English. Very <laughs> very uh, you understand it when he talks, but you gotta like you gotta talk slow to him and stuff and try not to use uh, synonyms and things he wouldn't understand. But it was fine, like in game, everyone understands. You know, use your stun, and gank, smoke. Right. You know, it's pretty simple. You uh, were really high on him as a player. Like you were prepared to. Was he going to be your drafter and captain? Uh, it was going to be way too. I think it was drafting, just because it's hard to have a captain doesn't speak your language. But he he was very good. I think he's probably the best player on the unknown team. Which kind of holds true, and that they don't have him as a captain, they're kind of they're not nearly as good. They were a pretty big threat. You know, the earlier qualifiers, now they're kind of eh. Yeah, like um, playing Infamous. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, right. So, I mean, they won that first open qualifier for the major, and then you guys uh, won the second one. So, just just walking back to basically. Joining DC from Archon, there, there are a couple of things we're really curious about talking to Sebastian. One of them is, um, no, I think Archon exceeded a lot of people's expectations when you guys basically uh, beat uh, beat DC to make it to Shanghai. I think a lot of people didn't expect you to be at that major, and you know, from a certain point of view, it's like this is a great learning experience. You're at a major, and like, you know, isn't that like a step forward or progress? But from what was it like from your perspective? Like, did you just think that it was too disappointing what the actual performance in Shanghai was, or what? I mean, I was disappointed. I thought we could win at least one game, but uh, yeah, it was nice. Like, I'm sure I wouldn't be where I was. I was not that major. It's a lot of publicity and showing what you can do, even if you're the worst team there. So, uh, but yeah, we we didn't really expect ourselves to go either. So. Um, mm. As far as like the teams that you played at the uh, major at Archon, like that tier of competition, did you guys have opportunities previously to like play with these level of teams, or yeah, you guys it, mostly everyone? To... Everyone in the qualifiers, like every year, just kind of scrims each other mm. until the groups are released, and then you don't scrim in your group. Right. You scrim the you scrim the other group. So we were pretty consistently playing against these teams that were all there. And so how does it feel to be like kind of on the uh or how did it feel because like you said previously the teams in the qual- like the qualifiers for the Manila major it felt like they were just really predictable did it feel like they had just your number in that sense or was it just feel like like they were just so much more sharper or b- playing their strategy better than you what is that sense for which which one are we talking oh, for, about for the, oh, for the for the major for the major, for the major. Like, what was what was the big difference that you felt uh, say between you guys and the other teams there. Was there something that really stood out to you? For which major? Shanghai major? Yeah. Uh, I think the teams were better. And Archon was obviously worse than my current team. So the skill was definitely very close. Like, between us, complexity and DC is kind of... Everyone kind of expected DC and complexity, and then maybe maybe us, you know, maybe... Maybe in a close second place, but uh, it's definitely much. It was definitely much harder the competition because it was like Owie and Balda and stuff in the in the major complexity in the major elite wolves were there. Infamous before they got banned. Zetok got banned. Pretty rough. Right. Well, well, I mean, for for the major itself, you know, was it like, um, was it like you felt like each lane or each individual lane, it was like, wow, there's really a skill gap here in every single lane, or was it more of like a team thing? It's like, hey, our strategies aren't as sharp, our execution isn't as good, like compared to other major tier teams. Can you repeat that? Sorry. Sure. Um, at the Shanghai major itself, when when you played against other teams or practiced against them. Did you feel that there was like a really big gap in individual skills? Say like every single lane, there's like a huge difference, or was it more of like a team execution, team strategy type of thing that was like really different? Yeah, it's a team execution thing. I think as the world gets older, individual skill kind of goes 
farther away from being relevant. You kind of hit like a wall where you you can't improve yourself very much. Obviously you can, but it gets, it gets slower and slower the better you get. Like you go up from this big jump from when you're first starting to like you get like 50% better. And then you hit the pro level and you hit the wall where you get like 0.01% better every time you play a game. So it's more about how you work with your team. How you do things and like get along and uh, the strategies you make can do. So our uh, teamwork and stuff is not nearly as good as it is on my current squad. Right. So, so was it kind of like there's like a minimum skill level that people have, and then beyond that, you, the team execution is really what matters. Since you can't really one v five anymore. It's like team execution and like uh, competitive experience and stuff like that. Because obviously, you play all these pubs, and that's how you get noticed. And then you go into uh, competitive games. And it's, like, uh, it's like relearning the game because you learn how to win pubs, but you're not going to play the storm spirit feeding on everyone in a competitive game. So you got to work. You don't learn to work with your team, like, trust each other, stuff like that. Right. Um, did that. Did that gap, do you think, was that a big factor in, in Archon not staying together after Major? Was it just like we, you know, we're missing too much in that? There was a lot of uh, internal struggle and issues with, uh, after the Major. We... Scrims did not go well, let's just say that. After we lost, it was pretty much, yeah, it was, it was pretty much over. I mean, if we didn't qualify, it was over. So... Oh. Um, so you, you talked about this a little bit before, but if you can walk us through kind of the, the reshuffle from your perspective, like, you know, like when did you start finding out things were happening and how did you react to that? Or, you know, how did you know that you end up on DC with these teammates? Uh, after Shanghai, JL pretty much left the team as we were walking off the stage. Like oh. 20 minutes after we lost, uh, JL went back to the hotel room. And then our manager was there and like texted everyone or whatever, however we communicated because Twitter was banned, so we couldn't use that. Uh, but J.O. didn't want to be on the team anymore. He wanted to go back to sea and play like in his home because he's from the Philippines. Mm. And then we're like, okay. And then we kicked monkeys. So it was just me, Fluff, and Whitebeard from there. And then after a few scrims and stuff, uh, Fluff kicked me. And then I told Archon because I was the only one at the Archon house. Because it was like, it wasn't mandatory. It was like anyone could stay there. I was living with a bunch of Hearthstone players and stuff. Uh, and they were like, okay, uh, we don't really want to uh, sponsor that, that team without you. So we'll just sponsor whatever team you make. See how it goes. So I tried to form this team with Soxa and PyCat, and then they both left. Soxa abandoned me as I look at him in the eyes as I say this. <laughs> I wake up one morning, and he's scrimming with Digital Chaos, oh. and I'm like, hey man, what's up? And he's like, I'm going to pursue other options, and I'm like, Duck FC. And so, and then PyCat uh, wanted to join a Euro team because he, he lives in Germany and stuff. And playing in it was hard for him, just you know, as a lifestyle. So I make this new team. I get new players because like, it's like a week before roster lock at this point. So I'm like struggling to find players for more than a day. So I get like this Ritsu, HFN, uh, Zitok, and Weitu. So it's going to like a, you know, they're all just a bunch of fucking ragtag retards. <laughs> HFN's Brazilian, like AK. Speaks, speaks Portuguese, by the way. Okay. So, and then Zetalk speaks Spanish. Similar, okay. but they don't, they don't speak each other's languages. So it's not Similar, like but talking to completely each other. different. Yeah. So they, we, we screened a couple of times, we're doing well. We're doing okay. Obviously, H HFN and Zetalk, like, we wish we want to be able to communicate more and like actually participate 
stuff and like we wish we could we could actually be, they felt like they could be better if they could speak the language and stuff and like talk mm-hmm. and discuss what strategies they wanted and then so that went on like three days passed we learned like the day before we were going to sign up for the majors that all of we- elite wolves got banned for that you know scheme like three months ago that 322 thing match mm-hmm. fixing and we're like yeah. okay well, the other team was infamous so I messaged Bruno, and I'm like, hey, who's banned? Tells me that Zetox banned. And he's the only one banned on Infamous. Wow. Which I think is because of how he defended himself when, uh, when, they, when they took him and Elite Wolves. Because they took Zetox, because he was the captain. And the captain of Elite Wolves. I think he just didn't defend himself very well. And so I was like, okay, this is awful. We scrimmed like one game without Z Talk, did not go nearly as well. And, and then I got an offer to join this current squad, and I was like, yeah, I, this is like a day before the fucking qualifier signs up. I was like, okay, sorry guys. Because I, I didn't want to like just leave these guys without a player a day before sign ups. I felt really fucking bad about it, but at the same time, you kind of have to do these things. You know? to succeed what you think is best for yourself. Right, so oh, that's, that's a really tough... I mean, a lot of people were put in a tough position, and this is one of those that people just haven't talked that much about, is that you, you kind of had to leave players behind too, because it wasn't settled, right? The new Archon wasn't settled, so people maybe didn't perceive that, but you did. You did have to leave people behind and yeah. you know, make a choice too, last minute. Yeah, I mean, I thought the... The roster with Zetok was the one I was going to stick with for a while. But then I learned he's banned, and I'm like, all right. Because <laughs> I really wanted to play with Zetok in particular. So when he was banned, I didn't you know, I didn't really want to stick around and see what happens with that roster if I didn't have to. I see. And obviously you still honor Zetok by keeping him in your uh, name. And um, Yeah, we also can't. Oh. I can't. No, one, no pro player can change their official info for about six months. So it'll be there for a while. I tried to change it like a week ago, and I learned that you can't edit your info until fucking August. So <laughs> solidarity. It's gonna, yeah. it's gonna have to last a bit longer well, for you. Huh? So well, August if you, one, because you bring that to TI, right? If it's dependent yeah, on August. Yeah. So so if you uh, leave your current team, you're gonna be a stand-in for four months because you can't change your info. That's rough. It's pretty shitty. Like if you have a sponsor, you can't you can't put the sponsor in your name. So so for DC, was it it sound sounded like was it like Saxa that, that kind of helped get the ball rolling on that? And you know, obviously they had two former major winners who just won the, the major with secret. And was it kind of like, oh hey, it's you from Shanghai, you know, that we like didn't really practice with? Like how how did that go? Uh the so Ali and Baba got invited to EG, and uh, who else was on that team? Feeman was invited to coach Secret like full time. So who was left on TC? Because obviously you don't you don't deny EG and Secret, you know, when they offer you to play. They're the teams yeah. with money, the ones that don't get you places. You know, you're invited to lands without playing a single match, stuff like that. Right. Uh, so who was left? It was just Resolution and Saxa. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have Weeha and Misery getting kicked from Secret. So it's like, you know, why not? Why not do this? Because Resolution's obviously very good. He's not an NA player. He's, a, he's from CIS scene, you know, Ukraine. And then Sox is just the 8.5k god, you know? And then I think I was recommended. By Bulba, they were asking who the shit they get such short notice. Bulba, Bulba was like, "Yeah, you probably get this guy, you know. He's the best you're gonna find for NA at least." So that was nice of him. Oh, that's so, awesome! I mean, you've you've been very highly regarded by a lot of respected NA players, so you that's that's awesome that that you know helped you and that worked out in that sense. Yeah, it's just just team reject here, you know. 
<laughs> was there any discussion of uh, of roles, or like was it kind of like they have every position set but off laner, and they kind of went with that, or was there discussion maybe you would you play a different role or would be hot? You know, I think he was initially saying that he wanted to play carry or something. Was there any of that discussion when you joined the team, or was it? Pretty uh, much so? I think Vihan Rezo didn't care what role they played in or carry, either of them. So I'm just kind of stuck with Vihan and carry, and we're like, let's just switch you guys. And it's, it's been working well. I'm pretty sure if they could find another support player, then Misery will be playing off lane. But can't, it's hard to find players like that that fit well, because the support's like the bread and butter of your team, you know? Right. You gotta, you gotta make sure you mesh well. A team that has a bad support duo is never gonna succeed. You'd say it's like the most important in terms of like chemistry and like just gelling together. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. Would you say that like the supports also have a lot to do in terms of like, um, typically like strategy in the game, or or for your team does it kind of all kind of just come out of collaboration with all your players, or that's like a misery big, and a big team thing. Out? But the supports okay. control the game, you know. Because obviously you have all these set roles, like Vihal's going to go mid, I'm going to go to the hard lane, and then wherever the supports go, whatever lane they want to go, wherever lane they want to help, is the one that's going to succeed, you know? It's the one that's going to be in control. So it's a lot on best in their decisions in the early game that sets up your cores to succeed. We, we've had a number of conversations with some players, uh, Aoi, for example, about like communication on the team. You talked about this earlier. You said, you know, a lot of things are pretty basic to Dota. Like you don't necessarily have to speak the same language fluently to talk about it. But what's the structure of communication like on your team? Like are certain people responsible for calls at certain times? Is there like one voice that you listen to above all else? Like how does that work on your team? Uh, I think it's the same with every team, right? You just, what your captain says to do something, you do it. Everyone else just kind of fills in and talks when they feel like they can make a play when they're in control of the game. Because it's it depends on the game, like who's making calls. Like if I'm if I'm Batrider or something, I'm gonna be making a lot of calls to gank. But if I'm like a Tide, I'm gonna be following other people's orders. Uh, you know what? Another major topic that I really wanted to talk about with you was kind of coming up through the NA scene. And, you know, obviously a lot of people rip on NA Dota. And uh, Aoi actually mentioned that some players on EG, for example, have tried to avoid that whole, a lot of the community, which they view as kind of like uh, toxic, maybe, or, you know, not, not that helpful. And so what was it like for you? Because you're relatively new blood when it comes up, when it comes to, uh, you know, coming through the NA grassroots scene. And what was it like, what was it like basically doing that? Coming through to NA? Yeah, like, like um, was it like, I think, because I think at the time, you know, before you started playing, there was less of an active NEL or, and Faced Pro maybe wasn't that active. And like, how did, you know, just describe your thought process. Like, when did you think it was a possibility that you could play professionally? And how did you approach that? Uh, I played a lot of those Sunday weekend cups. You know? And I remember one game, uh, I had like some, some team I just made with friends. That's how it always starts. And we got to the finals, and I uh, I remember there was some universe stored in a game for some team that was playing just in the finals, like their last game. And I remember I was playing like Slark versus like Weaver Wisp, and universe was Weaver, and I killed them both by myself. And I was like, I'm I'm good at this game, guys. <laughs> and that's where it clicked, you know. <laughs> that was that's like your awesome. moment. That was my that's moment awesome. that I uh, I dreamed about. For the next three months, you know, holding on to that when uh, things weren't going so good, mm -hmm. but you remember right. that you killed Universes Weaver. I was like, I killed, I killed him in this. This game doesn't matter. I'm like <laughs> one of the, just a pub, you know. I killed Dendi guys. <sighs> <laughs> that, that would craft my career. I'll just say that right there. <laughs> but, but yeah, okay. SCCS then, huh? That's the one. You guys, just yeah, that's that's a good tournament up. to play in. Just if you're, you don't know what to do, you know. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if you're if you have no experience and no name, you just play in everything you can with anyone you can. So that's that's got to be the first time I've ever heard. Oh, SECS has been brought up in our podcast. Um, I mean, you play against good people, like you mm -hmm. play against pub stars, and you can beat them. 
And it's like gain recognition. Even yeah, even these like small teams, teams you make with your friends, it's still still competitive. You know, you're gonna be playing the same way the pros do. Just you don't understand the game. You're not that good. But you're gonna be talking like they do, like yeah. trying to set up kills and make your movements good. So. So you weren't a big NEL guy or what? I played some NEL. Mm. Uh, I was not a big name. So you didn't have like the uh, aspirations to kind of grind the leaderboards or get into the like, really big games, or? Well, I was in like the the purgatory zone where I was better than XDL, IXDL, yeah. whatever. Yeah. But I was not good enough to be in NEL, so it was kind of a sad place. I remember, like before NEL went under, it was sort of like these two tiers of even the NEL games where you would have like there's the EG games and the non EG yeah, yeah. games, <laughs> and EG games, and then everyone else just kind of dumped into you know guys trying to get into the uh, EG games, right? Yeah. Um, if you got into the you know the the cool kids club, it's like there you go, you're just <laughs> another one of the guys. But yeah, it's it a good time. Memories, memories, good memories. I'm assuming oh. that Face It Pro has just kind of been defunct, or is are people still kind of participating yeah, in that, or that is it just all was, ranked? That league was awful. There was no rules. People just left games when they want, no punishment. Hmm. At the start of it, it was really good because everyone was playing. It was like three games at once, which is really good for an in-house league in NA. And then it turned into one game, or like two games under a week, and then one game, and then like half a game. And no one wanted to play. No one, hmm. like the people that were not fun to play with. We're not getting punished or anything, so I see. So you mostly just rely on solo ranks now to kind of, I mean, uh, post that period, or were you were you kind of getting to like the scrim scene after uh, those kind of in-house leagues go, went under? Yeah, I mean, I was on Archon when these Face It League was up, but I wasn't on our team when uh, when NEL was a thing still. So it was somewhere in between there, that I became better. Or recognized. Um, so, yeah, like obviously a lot of opportunities there, but what, what was your, you know, like a sense of priorities or like what was important to you? Because obviously um, solo MR is something that really gets people noticed, right? And then, like, how did you start getting offers or start getting the attention of like professional or semi professional teams? Like teams on that borderline, basically. Like, how did that happen? Uh, you just. Just play a lot of pubs and get your MMR high. And then it's also important to network a lot. Just play with everyone, make friends with people who have names. And eventually your name will get said. And then they're like, oh, yeah, I know that guy. And then when they need a player, maybe you get invited. And that's how it happened for me, just kind of luck. I got invited to Root Gaming. So, and then me. At like second place at this that Red Bull man against uh, champions of Summer's Rift. <laughs> so I remember I was I did well on that. I had like a seven zero juggernaut, so that was fun. That was awesome. Like, that was like two patches ago or something. Not even that, like maybe three. That was the. That was the Troll Warlord patch. Mask of Madness <laughs> every game. Everyone remembers the Troll Warlord Sniper patch with great fun. Yeah, that was, that was good stuff. I don't think any other patch stands out in terms of recent memory as much as that one in particular. I don't know. I think Invoker Spam gives it a run for its money. At least. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know, dude. This troll blinking on you and then you're bashed eight times. Like That was, that was depressing. The permabash. Or the sniper that you almost can't lane against because the, the shrapnel is just like... Oh, <laughs> shrapnel. <laughs> oh. Boca was annoying, but I, th I think that patch was like the scarring one for everyone. Like, we all kind of went through it together as, as Dota players, probably. P people have this perception of there being a huge gap between NA and, and other regions. Like, do you think that's, that's, you know, that actually exists? And if it does exist, what do you think is the problem? Or, or like, what's, what's the issue? I mean... It's more of a gap between the, like... Because obviously there's good NA teams that compete on the professional level. Tier 1 stuff, like complexity and EG. And then there's a giant gap between those teams and other teams. 
I'm watching a game right now between Nevernovas and Dragneel. It's 15 to 2. And uh, I think I've saw several walking down the mid lanes from this team on purpose, like a pub. So that's kind of what they're talking about, I think. But also, it's kind of exaggerated. But, but it's, it is there a little bit. Was that something that you consciously felt that you had to avoid? I mean, there's obviously, this is from the NEL thing, but like, you know, there's a lot of ego there. Sometimes there's a lot more ego than skill, or there's a lot of like, you know, chest puffing and stuff like that that doesn't really maybe have an impact on the game. Do you think that's like a, a regional or cultural thing more than anything else? That like gets in the way. NA has the biggest ego of every scene. Uh, that does like, that does get in the way. So then you stop learning. Like, I'm the best. I can't get any better. No one's better than me. XD. And then <laughs> and then you don't learn as much. You don't consider things. And like don't try to improve yourself because you're like I'm I'm the best, guys. You know. I something to learn at this point. And that's why but it's also because NA has the lowest population server. So the scene as a whole doesn't improve as fast because there's not as many players to play against and learn. None of competition in your pubs? Yeah, pretty much. I mean it's always been a complaint, right? From NA. Like five K average games and you're like eight K more. Yeah. And you're like, okay. But that never, that never happens in Europe and China. Just, that makes sense. There's twice there's as many a, players. Yeah, there's less less of a, like a competitive environment that's uh, cultivating yeah. better players because you get all these crappy mixed games and you have guys who are like super high ranked in terms of MMR, but there's still a pretty big gap between those guys and like like you mentioned the professional tier one guys. Um, yeah, I mean if I queue at the same time as my teammates, I'm always gonna find them. No matter what, because there's no one else high MMR queuing. Hmm. I don't know how much pubbing you did in China, but that was like the most tryhard pub Dota that, like, I don't think there's a single game where someone <laughs> threw or fed on purpose. Like, they just try to the bitter end, no matter what. Yeah, I don't know what's wrong with China pubs. I mean, not, they don't run down mid lane like NA pubs do. <laughs> what's wrong with them? <laughs> but, uh, something seriously wrong, huh? They're, they're a special breed. I saw a lot of. Jungle Dooms getting blade mail first item. I just it was it was something else. <laughs> they were like ignorant. They had their <laughs> one way of playing and that was the only way. The China Doom meme, right? <laughs> <laughs> Doom every game. And you're like, this hero's not even good. Stop. Doom hero, best hero. Probably been old Dota One veterans and that happened like ten patches ago or something. They just never stopped playing it that way. Like yeah, that. I mean and a pubs definitely are a lower skill, but uh, mainly because everyone just is an idiot, like tilts out of their mind when they don't get the bounty room and stuff. And you have to like convince your team not to run down the mid lane when they die once, and it's really <laughs> depressing. Like you can't even play the game sometimes. You're just like guys, come on, stop feeding. Thank you. Yeah, it's like not Dota, or it's just way too easy to just for someone. Like, you know, things don't go perfectly, and it's, like, time to throw. Yeah, um, time to throw. It's a classic. <laughs> All right, so uh, I think the qualifiers between... There's a bit of a longer time frame, basically. When Archon, when you qualified on Archon, it was, like, early January, and then late February was the major. So this time you've got about a month before uh, this ma next major starts. And so what's what's your preparation like between uh, now and the major, getting ready to go back into that battlefield? Yeah, just playing, playing, scrimming, uh, just watching all the replays and improving as a team. It's like, you just don't get lazy, you know? Just because you won the qualifiers doesn't mean you're number one. Just, just keep going. Don't think you're hot shit and stuff like that. Because it's really easy to do that. Has there, has there been a noticeable improvement in, in the quality of your scrims now that you have say, two major winners, or your team is much, maybe more respected now, uh, being able to get to that major? Uh, it's more of an improvement of, like, the willing to learn, and, like, wanting to win games, you know? It's a, it's a problem sometimes. Sometimes players just don't want to win. 
and so it's hard to win when no one wants to win. But like, when you really, really, really want to win, you know, it's, you play better than you <laughs> compared to when you're in your archon at the major and you're like, let's just go out there and do our best, guys. <laughs> So it's like a serious difference. It's just attitude, and yeah, you could even say like professionalism. Yeah, it's it's like attitude and stuff. Hmm. What, what what are the biggest takeaways for you personally? You know, from Shanghai, going into this next major. Or what are the biggest things you've learned from your two major major champions, basically? Uh, just it's like learning how to learn. You know, learning how to keep your skills in tone. To never get overconfident and stuff like that. Uh, considering all the options, and what to what to do and what to how to play. Because, like I said, you kind of hit a ceiling on the individual skill, but you learn how to be a better teammate and stuff. So, is that realm of uh, improvement the next step for you guys as a team? Like, yeah. What do you what, what do you see in the future as is in, in terms of Bring you guys and closing that gap in those tier one NA teams and trying to okay. really get to the international stage. Like, what what can you can highlight? Only, for can only go up from here, right? <laughs> it's like we're the NA qualifier coming in. Qualifier so champions. No one, no one cares about us really. Because it's like, congrats, you begin, you won NA qualifiers. Next <laughs> There's always an XD there. I like that. Because I mean, like you look at—I mean, you look at the other qualifiers, right? Like, you look at China, it's like LGD and E Home, massive teams. You look at, right? you look at Europe, it's like Empire and uh, I don't want to say like Adfinim, like No Diggity, look at NA, you're like Yep, Infamous, <laughs> Forehead. Have you been? Uh, how closely do do you watch um, these other tournaments and such? I mean, obviously, you know, right now the big tournament going on is Epicenter and Newbie is through the group stages and through the wild card has been kicking everyone's asses more or less. I mean, uh, what what have you observed uh, from from that tournament? Obviously, you don't have to give us any big secrets, but you know, what do you think so far? I just, I usually watch every tournament, so but you kind of see. What's working, what's not for every team. Maybe a team loses, but they pick this really good hero, and you're like, "Wow, that actually did a lot of work that game." Or maybe a team like Nuvi, and they're just winning every game. And you're sitting there like, "What are they doing that we're not?" So it's usually what happens every tournament. There's always some team crushing everyone, or someone that figured out a new way to play. So going into Manila, what what would be what would be an ideal not an ideal finish, but what would be an acceptable, you know, finish for you? Or like what realistically, what's your goal? Oh, for spice, dude. Come on. <laughs> that's, the, that's the attitude. That's, you gotta only gotta wanna win. Well you can't, we certainly can't settle you, for less. We certainly wish you the best of luck going into that, and you do after all have two winners of the last major on your roster. You've got a very talented team um, that is, uh, well, maybe less NA than some of the other NA Dota teams out there even. So that's, that's Could really be a cool. <laughs> <laughs> Could be a Trump. Yeah. All right. Uh, and no, man. I'd just like to thank Mu for coming on our show and hope you had a good time. Good yeah, luck no, at the, uh, no problem. Good luck in Manila. Good luck on the scrims. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, sir. it's kind of like by all accounts, the the, the karma you know is in favor of, of, of DC making it to major finally, and so you guys deserve that. Congratulations and uh, best of luck in Manila. Any uh, shout outs or comments you want to give uh, before we close out? Shout out to my old manager, you know Max, Max manager Max. He's the man. Did the walk of shame. It's no easy task. <laughs> so I've heard Sebastian also spoke very highly of Max, and uh, we'll see uh, where he heads off to next uh, within this esports circle. So thank you very much, 
uh, Moo, and I am your co-host for this Dot Pro Wednesday show, Korean Barbecue, together with my other co-host, Witch from Dota, uh, Moo. Where can we find you on uh, social media, stream, Twitter? Uh, everything is Moo Dota 2, Twitter and Twitch. All right, be sure to give them a follow and uh, Digital Chaos as well on social media as they do battle coming up in Manila in just under a month. Thank you very much. It's been the latest edition of the Dot Pro uh, Wednesday show. And you can find me on Twitter at KBBQ Dota, my co host at Wood True Dota, and of course our entire Dot P network of shows and podcasts at Dot P underscore show. Uh, coming up tomorrow will be Theorycraft Thursdays with Arsenity and Proud as usual. Uh, thank you so much for listening in, and we'll see you next week.